to be disturbing, they give you a bit of a warning and say, this is not for sensitive viewers. And there's a part of you that, that keeps looking and keeps watching because, I don't know, they call us rubbernecks sometimes. We see what happens. I've learned to close my eyes and, and look away because it's just so broken and so depressing. Bodies lying defeated, dead, looking up at the sky, evidence of some horror, maybe a natural disaster, maybe a war. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be reminded of the pain that the world is in. I want to leave the room. I want to go read a book or, or find a comedy show to watch. I pick up the newspaper and I read about school children who are failing at school because they are undernourished and undersupplied. Or I witness a friend's life falling apart as they just keep their head above water and kick against the waves hopelessly and helplessly. I don't like to look at difficult things. I don't know about you. But today I must stop for a minute and look at the cross. Stop for a minute and, and try to talk about it and try to describe and explain what happened there. And face up to the gruesome horror of what it is. The grinding crunch of nails through bones and tearing tendons. The whipped raw skin of Jesus' back pressed up against a splintering piece of wood. The cruelty of soldiers who will simply break legs so that those hanging on crosses cannot hold themselves up to breathe and suffocate. The sharp piercing thorns of a cruelly fashioned crown and Jesus with life draining slowly from his body. Loss of blood, dehydration in the hot sun, delirium, pain, confusion, suffocation, but the body fights for breath and so every time he needs to breathe, he ignores the pain in his arms and hands and in his feet and pushes himself up to take a breath and at the same time as receiving that life-giving breath, feels excruciating pain running through every part of his body. It seems so senseless. It's a scandal, says the Bible. It's a stumbling block to many, a stumbling block to faith. And I read Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. And by his bruises, we are healed. There's a part of my thinking that I think tries to, create, to correct this scripture in my own head. I often think of it and I often read it as he was wounded by our transgressions. But that is clearly not the word. It would somehow be more acceptable if I could say that my sin has done this to him. That I've gone out and done something cruel here and that seems only right. But the word is for he was wounded for our transgressions. Isaiah the prophet helps us to understand a few hundred years before the time of Jesus, what God is going to do in himself. 
we get kind of confused and we wonder, what's God doing here? But then we remember that this Jesus is fully God, being fully human, being with us, experiencing our struggles and our troubles with us. And he is doing something for us. As much as we might take responsibility and try to blame the Roman soldiers or the Pontius Pilate or the Jews of the day, Jesus is busy doing something for us that we cannot do for ourselves. In John's Gospel, as Jesus goes to the cross in the description, John purposefully says he carried the cross by himself. As his disciples warn him against going towards Jerusalem and saying the things that he's doing that'll end up getting him killed, Jesus keeps on insisting that this is the way that I should go. For our transgression. Of his own volition, going to the cross for our sins. Jesus is saving us. The Bible translation I've used says iniquities, which is how you sin if you're posh, you commit iniquities. I don't need much convincing to know that I am a sinner, that I have iniquities. I've spoken about looking at the TV and wanting to look away. Part of the reason I want to look away is I realize that I am responsible in some strange way for the stuff that I see. That the injustice of South Africa and the brokenness of South Africa, as much as we can blame politicians and corruption and all of that, each of us has our part to play. Isaiah says, all of us were like sheep that were lost, each of us going his own way. I don't know much about sheep, but I have a, a stupid dog. And he wants to, I don't know if he wants to be friends with or he wants to fight with the neighbor's dog. But he is absolutely determined to get out there. And if you open the gate and he takes a gap, he hides under the car when he sees that you're there. So he's not actually that stupid. He's quite clever. And then he bursts out of the gate. And we live in quite a busy road. And he runs across the road back and forth taking charges at the dog next door. And if ever you see me standing out in my pajamas going like this in the middle of the road, it's because my dog is at it again. He's outfoxed me again. I think it's the same for sheep and shepherds. Sheep are pretty stupid and they see some grass up on the edge of a cliff somewhere and they nibble their way down to the edge of some precipice where they're about to fall in. Or they end up floating away on a clump of mud, grazing peacefully as they don't realize they're being flooded away. And some poor shepherd is jumping in the water, holding onto a flimsy rope just to rescue them out. This is what God is doing, rescuing stray sheep. We are the sheep that are stubborn and blind to everything going on around us, and doing things our own way. But the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserved, the trouble that we were going to get into and one day I won't be surprised if I get hit by a car trying to keep my dog from being hit by a car. One day, the trouble that we're getting ourselves into, Jesus gets in the way for us. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Like I'm reminding us, he was pierced for our transgressions, not by. Jesus 
was intentionally loving us enough to get in the way for us. But I still wonder, how could it be so gruesome and cruel? And I felt a bit bad using the crunching nails in tendons line at the beginning because I knew it should make you squeamish. But the reason Jesus has to die this way is because we are that messed up. I look at what's happening on TV and I think of Russian soldiers committing atrocities. And I wonder if I was under the same regime, would I perhaps expose evil in myself that was just as bad? The thing about looking at Jesus on the cross and realizing that he is dying for us and the the immensity of the cruelty of this moment is so important because our sin is that bad. You see, one of us might sort of say, well, Jesus, uh, you know, all that dying on the cross business, I don't think you need to do all of that for me. You know, maybe just, just one of the nails, maybe. Maybe just the crown of thorns. It was Augustine of Hippo who said, he loves every one of us as if there were only one of us. And I want you to feel not a sense of guilt, but a sense of relief as you realize that this gruesome death on the cross, this horrific torture, is Jesus death for you. You don't have to pretend. You don't have to hide some, some secret sin that you think is hidden from God. You can come to him just as you are because he has met you exactly where you are. In your brokenness, in your struggle, in your frailty, in your, in your feeling like you've got nothing left to give, in your feeling like you can do nothing about it, Jesus is there. He's gone all the way for our sins, for our iniquity. Psalm 22, we didn't finish. And Isaiah 53 goes on to speak of the victory that God will give. After a life of suffering, he will again have joy. He will know that he did not suffer in vain. My devoted servant with whom I am pleased will bear the punishment of many. And for his sake, I will forgive them. I sometimes think that maybe God's forgiveness of my sins depends on the sincerity of my prayers or the quality of my repentance. It doesn't. Read that line there. For his sake, I will forgive them. Jesus is the one confessing your sins and your brokenness. Jesus is the one bringing you as you are to God's throne room of grace and saying, this is the one I have chosen and he has paid the price for you. For his sake, says the Lord, I will forgive them. He willingly gave his life and shared the fate of evil men This Bible is normally inclusive. I don't know why it's just men in that one. He took the place of many sinners and prayed that they might be forgiven. Let us pray.
Lord, let the depths of your grace roll through our hearts and souls. We like to pretend that we're not that bad, that we have potential for evil. We are like stubborn sheep that have gone astray. And all our stubbornness leads to more complications and brokenness. With our words and our deeds, we cause so much pain for others. And yet, Lord, you take into yourself all of that pain. And you heal not just our hearts, but this broken universe in which we live. Because as much as we see you, Jesus, a person on a cross, our small minds need to embrace the notion that you are not just a person on a cross, but God, the creator of all the universe, the one in whom all things have their being. And we realize that not just us, but all things can be reconciled to you. And on that last final day, death will have lost its sting. Evil will have been defeated. And our wounds, the wounds of all the earth, will be truly healed. Because you, Jesus, had died for us on the cross. So we lift up our prayers for the world around us. In this holy time, as we remember the sacrifice of the cross,